today is the conclusion of our series, Make War, which I know sounds really like overly masculine and really aggressive, uh, but today I think you're going to understand a little bit more as to why we chose the phrase, Make War. Larry Waters uh, grew up in Minnesota, which for many months out of the year, it's ice and it's snow. And the lakes freeze so much that people actually put uh, small houses on top of the lake, on top of the ice. They, they actually have fires on the ice in the middle of these houses. They drive their trucks, their one-ton pickup trucks on top of the ice. It's, it's normal. Well, Larry Waters had a, a great respect for ice, meaning he understood that it was dangerous and there were safe times to play on the ice and there were safe times not to. So, so Larry knew uh, the consequence of bad ice. And, and Larry shows up to the lake with his wife, Chrissy, and they, they pull up alongside the lake and they see fresh tracks from cars uh, on the ice. And they're like, okay, great, we're, we're in great shape. This is, this is going to work out really well. They, they pull off their four-wheeler, which is a lot lighter than a vehicle, and they start taking out over the ice. And everything is great until it's not. Like, how many of you experienced that moment in life where everything was great until it wasn't? All of a sudden, they hear the sound of what sounds like a gunshot going off, at which the four-wheeler starts plummeting into the water, bringing Larry and his wife, Chrissy, into the water. And, and the four-wheeler sinks like a rock. Larry and Chrissy start making their way up towards the surface and the freezing cold water. They make it out of, uh, out from underneath the water, but now they have to get out completely out of the water. And, and as they start clawing at the, the ice, they realize that they, they can't get enough of a grip. They pull off their gloves. Same thing. No grip. No traction. This got bad fast. Larry is the first one to come to the conclusion hey, there's no one here to help us. We're probably going to die. Larry turns to the wife that he loves and he kisses her goodbye. And as he, as he turns to, to face his bride, worry, fear, or a downward spiral in his soul. I know there's been many, like, many nights in my life where that's been my story, where I'm not in the waters of a lake, I'm in the challenges of life, and worry starts to creep in, fear starts to creep in, and, and I feel completely helpless, like, God, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't know, maybe there's some of you today that, that your present reality is you live in worry. You, you look at the amount of bills, <laughs> you, you look at the amount of... Uh, income and you're like, it doesn't make any sense. You look into a relationship with a spouse, a friend, a family member, a child, and, and it wasn't always like this, but this is, this is worse than you thought it could ever get. And worry, fear, depression begin to take over. Anxiety fills your head. The scripture is called this Evening wolves. The evening wolves. And before they talked about the, the internal struggle of the evening wolves, they talked about a very physical struggle of uh, evening wolves. Israel was in a place early on where there was an army that was significantly larger than them. And even as they're describing this army, they said it's a, it's a bitter and hasty nation. They are terrible and dreadful. Swifter than leopards and more fierce than, than evening wolves. As they looked into themselves and they looked at the size of this army, they're like, there's, there's no way this ends well for us. And I wonder how many of us here today, if we were completely honest, that we've got that place in our life where we, as we look out, we're like, I don't know how this ends. And I don't know that this ends well. If we're going to become the version of ourselves that we want to be, we need to know that there is a war with the evening wolves. Some of you are very aware of the evening wolves that, that eat away at your soul. And for most of us, I think the battle's at night, right? Like, does, don't we know the enemy works the night shift? 
It's not at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's like 10 o'clock at night. As soon as your head hits the pillow, all of a sudden your mind starts unleashing things. And we'll just turn on a television or just anything to like just try to make the, distract ourselves. But internally, that, that worry, that anxiety becomes just too much. And what do you do when you find yourself in the downward spiral? You know, I think one of the things that we often do is we add to it. We add to the spiral. We, we make it worse. We, we, start, we start giving our mind over to it. We give ourselves to worry. We let ourselves go down that path. You're like, wait, can, can you really like, have that much control over your mind? Well, Jesus said we could. Jesus said don't worry. In fact, one of the most common phrases in all of Scripture is the phrase, do not be afraid. Usually when God is telling someone don't be afraid, there's a lot of reason to be afraid. It's not don't be afraid because everything in life is great. It's don't be afraid because everything around you seems like this doesn't end great. And Jesus says, don't worry. Don't be afraid. And in turn, we're like, why? So we give ourselves to worry. We give ourselves to fear. And then begins the downward spiral. Because we get to choose what we give our thoughts to. The mental horsepower. Like in your vehicle, when you get in your vehicle on your way out of here, you can't put your vehicle in drive and reverse at the same time. The energy of the vehicle has to be put in one direction or the other. What direction are you putting your mind to? Is it towards your future, believing God's promises and his blessing that he wants to pour out on your life? Or are you believing something less than? And I wonder how many of us give the horsepower of our mind, that cognitive energy, just to the wrong places, and the downward spiral produces a result that God never intended. Uh, Daniel Goleman, in the book Emotional Intelligence, which is, is a great book, it, it swept our nation. It, it's such a powerful, um, powerful uh, a book about the effects of the emotions on our body. Uh, in fact, we have the, the quote up here for you. Um, it is the number, uh, I think we have it for you, there we go. The number of worries that a person, that people report while taking a test directly predict how poorly they will do on it. Meaning, th they did a study of people taking the same test. And before they took the test, they just sat them down and says, hey, what are you thinking about going into this test? And all of those that were like, I don't know that I studied enough, I'm not a very good test taker, I think I've got a lot of problems going on in my life. They were, they were giving their mental energy into worry Versus people are like, oh, I prepared for this test. I think I'm going to do great. I'm a great test taker. I'm going to do awesome. They said just the fact that they gave their mental energy in one direction or another directly impacted the results of the test. There is power to what you put your mental energy towards. But we have a culture that has taught us to feed the wolves, to give your energy to worry. And let me tell you, worry makes you worse, right? Right? Have, have any of you worried and then added value or even found a solution to your problem? Isn't it true that worry has oftentimes done the exact opposite? Like, it's actually made it significantly worse. Like, our worry added to the problem. We got worried, we responded in a way we never intended to, or we overreacted because we're so worried and anxious and fearful, and then we made the situation significantly worse than it originally was. And our culture just said, hey, this is normal, just accept it. Worry and anxiety is just like, just medicate it. Which is why one out of five Americans have an illicit dr drug problem. One out of five. And this is the ones they're aware of. One out of five Americans are using a drug that was not prescribed to them to numb their reality. One out of ten are on antidepressants. I'm not saying that there's not a place for antidepressants. I just don't know that one out of every 10 people in the world, that God's ultimate design was that one out of 10 people are going to need to help improve the chemical balance inside of their mind. And in fact, in the last couple of years, painkillers has just topped car accidents as the most likely cause of accidental death in the U.S. More than car accidents is overdosing on painkillers. Just trying to numb the worry anxiety, and fear. In fact, 
In the last 20 years, suicide has gone up by 25%. In fact, they even believe it's even higher than that. The reason they believe it's even higher than that is, especially among men, they want to take care of their families if they're going to be gone. So they have a health insurance policy, so they do their very best to make it look like an accident so that their family can be taken care of after they're gone. It's not okay. There are wolves in our lives that are looking to take you out. Evening wolves. There are wolves in your life looking to take your kids out. If you've been a parent and have parented a child to at least the age of like three, you are aware that there is another power inside of them that is leading them in a place. You're like, how did you come to that conclusion? Where did you learn that? What's wrong? There is a very real enemy looking to take your kids out, looking to take you out. So we did a series called Make War. And week one, we talked about thinking like a champion. That the first thing that has to happen is we have to allow God to retrain the way that we look at the world that we live in, to retrain the way that we look at ourselves and retrain the way that we interact with the world based on our thinking. And then we have to start speaking like a champion. Hey, there's power to our words. There's life and death in our tongue. The last week we talked about acting like a champion. That if you have a lot of thoughts and you have the right words but there's no action behind it, you're like, that's pretty hypocritical. And today I want to talk about the last one, which is fight like a champion. If there's a war and there's evening wolves looking to take you out, you're going to have to fight like a champion. The scripture says that the battle that we face isn't against flesh and blood, but that there's a spiritual battle that's taking place. And he says, you have a very real enemy that you cannot see. And in fact, I'll prove it to you. You have had thoughts in your life that you're like, I have no idea where that thought came from. It didn't come from you. It didn't come from you. You have an enemy. The scripture says the enemy is looking to steal, kill, and destroy. He's going to do it through entertainment. He's going to do it through uh, little lies in, in the midst of messages that you're listening to, through television and music. I'm not saying don't listen to TV or listen to music. I, I watch TV and I listen to a lot of music. But not everything that you're hearing is true. And the enemy is looking to just start to steal from you. Kill some things inside of you and ultimately destroy you. But then the question is why? Why does the enemy care so much about you? Here's why. Because before you were ever born, God created you in his mind. And he created you with purpose. That there was an assignment on your life. That he intended to use you to make a difference in the lives of other people. And I just want to tell you today, you haven't messed it up. I don't care what you've done on Friday. I don't care how you spent 10 years of your life. Here's what I'm telling you. God is bigger than your past, and God has an assignment on your life and a calling on your life. And the reason the enemy is so interested in wiping you out is because he sees the potential on your life. So if your world's falling around, you must be starting to ask the question, man, I wonder what God's up to. This morning here at Vibrant during the setup was the most stressful time I've ever experienced leading up, like, on a single Sunday morning. It was more than launch day. And I'm like, man, I wonder what God's going to do today. I literally went back into another room and started praying, thanking God for the struggle. I'm like, wow, God, you're doing something great today because the enemy is trying to make me anxious, trying to make me worried, trying to make me fearful. So I'm grateful that God has a calling on my life, and today's going to be great, and he's going to give some people some victory today. Come on. So, Teddy Roosevelt died at the age of 60. We started the series with this president named Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and at the age of 60, he passed away. And he passed away at nighttime while he was sleeping. In fact, the vice president at the time said this about him. He said, death had to take Roosevelt sleeping, for if he had been awake, there would have been a fight. There was a reputation of this young man. A fight in his spirit. Uh, and, and he defined a single moment in his life when he decided that he wasn't just going to accept life as it was. He found himself in a literal battle with a barbed wire in front of him. And he knew the moment he goes across that wire is the moment he steps into enemy territory and the odds are ever stacked against him. But he says as he rose up and he stepped across that barbed wire, a power like a wolf rose up inside of him. He knew that there was something great that was going to happen. Afterwards, he went on to write, get this, 26 books. He wrote 26 books. I have friends who are authors, and they're like the 
writing a book is the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. Like, it's almost as hard as planting a church in Broward County. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, in fact, there's, there's a story of Teddy Roosevelt where uh, some pirates, yeah, pirates, you heard me correctly, some pirates came and stole his boat, at which he started hunting them for eight days, found them in the middle of winter, and could not tie their hands behind their back because it was so cold that their hands would literally freeze and die and potentially fall off. So at nighttime, to ensure they wouldn't get away, he took their boots and slept with their boots. Right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, and while he was campaigning for president, he actually got shot right before one of his speeches. And with a bullet still inside of him, all of his campaign managers were like, we have to get you to a hospital right now. You're going to die. He's like, no, I came here to give a speech. And that guy's not taken away from me what's been promised to me. So he gets, gets up and gives a 90-minute speech, 90 minutes, an hour and a half with a bullet inside of him, talking about the future of America and what he saw it could be. He gets off of the platform. And he's like, all right, guys, it's time to go to the hospital. But there was, a, there was a spirit inside of him. There was a fight inside of him. And there's some of you today that you need to get some fight inside of you. I almost brought some boxing gloves, but I'm like, that's too soft. Like, like let's take the boxing gloves off. We're not going to start fighting fair because the enemy isn't fighting fair in your life. And, and I, there's going to be a fight inside of you. There's a fight for your life. There's a fight for your kids. There's a fight for your future. There's a fight for your finances. There's a fight for your marriage. There's a fight for your kids. There's a fight. And it's time to stop acting like life is a playground and start acting like life is a battleground. And believing that God has a purpose and a calling on your life, that he wants to do something great in and through you. And once you make war, you need to fight like you're at war. The apostle Paul had planted a church like ours in a city called Corinth. And after he left, he wrote back to the church because they were expressing, hey, we're recognizing that like, hey, this is really hard. And there's a battle going on, and this is a little nuts. And he said, hey, I want to encourage you in this. He says, I do live in the world. I've got the same problems that everybody else has, the same relational problems. I've got, I've got, I've got problems. I've got, I've, I'm following Jesus, but that doesn't mean my life's all puppy dogs and rainbows. I live in the same world as you, but, but get this. I don't fight my battles the way that people of the world do. <laughs> my weapons have the power of God. Some of you today, that's what God wants to give you, a weapon that's bigger than you, a strength that so far surpasses the own strength within inside of yourself. And man, I hope if you walk out here today, I hope, I hope you walk out with this. Like people ask me all the time, like, when people leave Bible, what do you hope that they, they walk away with? I hope that people walk away knowing that God is for them, that they've experienced God. Jesus said, my, my sheep hear my voice. I hope that you know that when you showed up here, God was here and he was for you and he's already made a victory for you and he's got a plan for you. And he says, I don't fight my battles uh, the way that everybody else does. My weapons have the power of God to destroy the camps of the enemy. So I destroy every claim. What's that? Uh, that thought. I destroy every evening wolf and every reason that keeps people from knowing God. Notice he doesn't say knowing about God. That'd be religion. He said, no, 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 I want to destroy everything that's keeping people from actually knowing God, having relationship with God. So I keep every thought under control in order to make it obey Christ. Early on in this series, I shared that my favorite animal growing up was a wolf. And I, I love studying wolves as, as a kid. And I've just kind of done some research recently. And I, I wanted to know, what is the, the number one cause of death among wolves? Like, why does a, a wolf die? Um, uh, for a pup... Uh, a, a puppy, wolf, most likely death is when the parents get wiped out and they end up starving to death. Uh, but some wolves die because they get kicked in the head by a buffalo, like in the midst of the hunt. The hunt's dangerous. But the most common way that a wolf dies is by other wolves, by other packs that are trying to accomplish something different than them. And you've got some wolves in your life, some real ones, probably even know what they are that are looking to take you out so today i want to give you four things to walk away with to know how to fight to, to walk in, in the power of god and not just the power within yourself and here's the first one control the high ground control the high ground look at the person next to you and say control the high ground 
and, and the Greek, which is the language the New Testament was written in most of it, um, th- there's this phrase called a stronghold. So a stronghold is kind of like high ground. So when you think high ground, think like the Battle of Gettysburg. It was on a really high hill, small mountain. The high ground is where the power was, and they wanted to control the high ground. A sniper, before he goes on a mission, he scopes out high ground because he wants gravity to be on his side. He wants there to be another force at play that helps him accomplish his mission. And in your life, when it comes to your heart, your mind, your soul, you have to fight to keep the high ground. But there's some things in in your life that have a tendency to get strongholds or get the high ground and keep you from living the life that God intended for you. Some of those are addictions. I shared with some of them about, like, medications. Some of them are things you watch on TV or on the Internet that you should know you shouldn't watch. You know it corrupts your soul. I can talk about habits and just negative habits in your life that continue to produce the wrong effects. Over 80% of doctor's visits are stress-related. 80%. The, the natural reflexes that, that you've developed over time because someone hurts you and fear of what could happen or what people are thinking about you cause you to react in a way that negatively impacts the results that you get to live in. I can talk about the emotional patterns that you've developed, that when you see a conversation happen at the office or in the workplace and you think that maybe oh, they're talking about me. Uh, they're not talking about you. No one's talking about you as often as you think that they're talking about you, by the way. little side note. Um, but the way that you get the high ground is what you start and you end your day with. So, so I want to give you something. That one of the ways you get to control the high ground is this. Write this down, 888. What? 888? 888. Uh, eight hours of sleep, eight glasses of water. You're like, I came to church to hear this. Yeah. And spend eight minutes, eight minutes of the start and the end of your day with God. Eight hours of sleep. Let's talk about that one real quick. I meet a lot of people that say, man, I just have a hard time getting eight hours. Are you crazy? Like, how does anyone get eight hours of sleep? Um, part of the reason why I think our culture struggles to fall asleep is social media. We, we spend our lives studying other people's lives. And then we compare their highlight moment that was Instagram-worthy or Facebook-worthy to our mundane moment, and we're seeing them partying, and they got invited to the party, and you're not at the party, and you're like, man, I'm such a loser. And then you wonder why you can't sleep, because fear and anxiety creep in. Uh, or here, here's another one. Uh, what you watch at night impacts you. In fact, last night, uh, sometimes I, I – Confession, I tell on myself all the time, welcome to Vibrant. I'm the pastor. I don't have it all together. I like to watch uh, TV shows just to make my mind slow down a little bit. And, and I told John, t- she likes to watch um, Downton Abbey. And I'm like, it's the most boring show ever. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't get it. I don't. I didn't watch it through. So I was just like, J- could you turn that on? Because if you turn that on, I'm going to fall asleep. It's going to be great. Just turn that thing on. Um, but, but some of us like to go to sleep watching The Walking Dead. I'm just saying, you're like, I, I don't know why I can't fall asleep. Maybe because you watched a zombie eat somebody's face off, and then you're surprised you can't fall asleep. But did, did you know that um, people who are underslept actually struggle with depression more than anybody else? In fact, I wonder if some of the reasons why you're not getting the promotions that you're getting is how tired you are at work all the time. That your cognitive mental horsepower is not being put in the right places, therefore you're not getting opportunities that even God wants to give you. Let's talk, about, let's talk about water. Um, do you know the majority of headaches are dehydrated, dehydration related? Like the majority of the time you get a headache, it's just because you haven't had enough water. Uh, in fact, in our, in our culture, we have, we have trained ourselves that we have trained our body that we feel the sensation that we're thirsty, that we go eat something instead. So now we have an overeating problem when our body's just saying, give me water, and you're like, I'm going to give you a burger instead. And you're like, I don't understand. I'm so tired. I'm gaining all this weight. Drink some water. Uh, Because God will never do for you what you could do for yourself. And some of you right now, you're praying for a breakthrough. And God's like, your bed's right there. Go to bed on time. Uh, The the faucet, you have clean, you live in a culture that has clean water. Turn the faucet on and get your eight glasses. And now, let's talk about the last one. How you start and end your day really matters. And I just want to encourage you. Here's a great place to begin. Eight minutes. All of you have eight minutes. If you just woke up eight minutes earlier and you spent eight minutes in the morning with God, and the last eight minutes before you put your head on that pillow and close your eyes, you spent eight minutes with your God, and you're like, 
but pastor, I spend hours with God. Awesome, you're holier than all of us. You win, pat yourself on the back. For everybody else, I just want to encourage you to start with eight minutes. Eight minutes. What can you do in eight minutes? I encourage you to do this. Listen to one worship song and sing along. Sing out loud. Sing. I know, like, that's so weird. It's not weird. You shout at football games. You can sing in your bedroom, in your car. In fact, many of you do sing in your car. You just think it's weird to do with worship music. It's not weird. So one worship song, pray for two minutes. I'm going to give you a little secret. Spend the first minute just thanking God for the good things in your life. I mean, I'm going to tell you. And then spend the last minute, now that you have a great perspective, asking him for some great things in your life. And next week we're starting a whole new series called Live in My Best Life. Who wants to live their best life? Right? Come on, somebody. We're going to talk about how, what it really means to live your best life. And we're going to talk about having big faith and, and how to pray. And next week, you're not going to want to miss it. We're going to talk about how do you begin a life of prayer and having big faith and seeing God do great things in your life. You're, you're going to want to come back next week, Sunday. It's going to be pretty great. Um, and, and then read one scripture. And you might even get a little crazy and, and read two. But I encourage you to start in the book of John. Find some of those red letters, which just mean Jesus said it. And just start getting some scripture inside of you. And, and now think about this real quick. If you spent the next six weeks getting, on average, eight hours of sleep, you got eight glasses of water a day, and you spent the first eight minutes and the last eight minutes of your day with God, would you even recognize yourself? Would you even, like, do you know how much better work would be if you just lived that way? Do you know how much better your friendships would be, your relationships would be? But you have an enemy that wants to wipe all that out. So he wants to come in with a foothold that he might get a stronghold. And here's the truth about the enemy. The enemy will always take you further than you thought you'd go, right? How many of you are in, in the midst of, and don't raise your hand, uh, you can if you want to because I tell myself all the time, uh, you're, you're in a struggle and you're in a struggle further than you ever thought it would get. Like I, I didn't think it would get this far. How did I get this far? It's kept you longer than you thought that you'd stay. I'm like, it's only going to be one time. And you're like, I might, why am I still struggling with this? And it will cost you more than you thought you'd ever pay. So what are the little lies in our lives that keep us from living and fighting like a champion? Here, here's a couple of them. Uh, just one more. Just do, just do it one more time. It's the last time. You ever had that thought go in your mind? Just the last time. You, we won't ever do this again. Just, just one more time. And then you do it, and the enemy's like, you're pathetic. I can't believe you did that. You better do it again. Or, or here, here's another one that I hear all the time, especially among men. Um, I can quit anytime. Anytime I can quit. If you could quit, you would have already. I can quit anytime. I'm, I'm still in control. Really? Really? And the enemy's looking to get a foothold, that he might get a stronghold, keeping you from the promises that God has spoken over your life before you were ever born. In fact, in the scriptures, it says that all of your days are written in this book. He had a plan. He still got a plan. So when it comes to keeping the high ground, it's 888. It's also this. Starve your fear, feed your faith. Starve your fear, feed your faith. What are the things that are building fear inside of you? For some of you, you just watch CNN way too much. Like, you are unpleasant to be around because there's a negative attitude around you all the time. Like, my gosh, could you watch a little bit less? I'm not saying don't be informed or don't know what's going on in the world. I'm just saying, like, do you know how the news makes their money? It's by putting fear in people. So you tune in tomorrow to find more reasons why you should be afraid. Watch the news with that lens and tell me I'm wrong. Again, I'm not saying don't be informed. I'm saying be informed. But don't give your life to it. Starve your fear. Feed your faith. How do you feed your faith? Well, if the, if the wolves come at night, what are you going to have with you at night? So next to my bed, actually, there's a, there's a scripture. It says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear because wherever you go, the Lord is with you. I've got some scripture inside of me. And, and you know what? When I'm tempted to do something I know that I shouldn't do, I've got some scripture inside of me, too. 
And greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And I am more than a conqueror. And God's got a plan on my life. And there's a calling and a destiny that he wants to fulfill in me. And you know what happens when I start getting tempted at night and the evening wolves show up and the anxiety starts creeping in and the worry starts creeping in and I start bringing out some scripture verses and some promises of God on my life? It's like being in jail and you got the toothbrush and you go to the devil and you're like, shank, cut, cut. Like... Some of you need to get a little bit aggressive, okay? How do you get aggressive with the enemy? I'm, I'm not even playing. Get some scripture verses by your bed. Get some scripture verses inside of you. It's that eight minutes, and you go to the enemy, and you'd be like, cut, cut. Because here's what the enemy wants for you, a miserable life. Some of you are living a miserable life. That's his plan all along. And you've probably bought into some of his lies. Let me t- let you know the secret to a miserable life. Live a life all about you. Live a life all about the amount of money you make, the size of house that you have, the car that you drive, the clothes that you wear, the people you roll with, the people you don't roll with. The secret to a miserable life is to live one all about you. I got to keep moving on. All right. So we're going to control the high ground. The next thing is this, is fight fire by being on fire. Fight fire by being on fire. You're like, what does that mean? I'm going to go back to that scripture verse that Paul had said to this young church. He says, I live in the world, the same one as all of you. I've got the same problems that all you got. But I don't fight my battles the way that other people do. The weapons I fight with are the weapons, are not the weapons the world uses. In fact, they are just the opposite. My weapons have the power of God to destroy. Get this, destroy the camps of the enemy. Not keep the enemy out of my camp. He's actually saying, destroy the camps of the enemy. That I actually have some territory that God wants me to take and not just live on the defensive. He wants me to live on the offensive. And some of you, the breakthrough that you're looking for is to just start getting on the offense instead of just living on the defense. Because when you spend time with God every day, and here's, here's part of that prayer, when you're asking God for something, when, when you receive Jesus, Jesus, when he died, he resurrected and he ascended into heaven. And he said, there's something coming after me. It's a part of God that you haven't experienced yet. It's the Holy Spirit. And when you give your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. And he starts cleaning things up. He starts giving you weapons you didn't have before. Access to a power you didn't have before. And some of you need to walk out of here today with some power inside of you. And you need to start asking every day, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Why? Because driving a, a car for 400 miles is like living a full day. Eventually you kind of run out of gas. Nothing's wrong with your car. It just needs a little bit more fuel. Every day you go before God and say, God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? And when you start spending time in worship and you spend some time praying and asking God and believing for big things in your life and you start getting some scripture inside of you, there's a fire that develops. I mean, have you ever met someone that's on fire? Like, like, I mean, some of you have met a Christian that's not on fire because they don't fuel their spirit anymore and you're like, oh my goodness. But man, when you get around someone like the real deal, man, there's a fire inside of them. There's a belief inside of them. And that's what God wants for you. He wants a fire inside of you because you know what? It's hard to burn what's already burning. The devil can't burn what's already burning. Third thing is this, is raise your voice. When you are in the thickest battle, your voice carries the greatest power. My name is Maximus Meridius, commander of the northern army, husband to a murdered wife, father to a murdered son, and I will have my revenge on this life or the next. Some of you got that scene running through you right now. And the reason you like that movie is I want that kind of spirit inside of me. That's it. It's the voice. He, he had to say out loud in front of his enemy, this is what's coming your direction. Watch out. Some of you need to raise your voice. Uh, I'm getting ready for Easter, which, by the way, Easter is coming. It's going to be our first Easter. There has never been a time in our church history where it's been so easy to invite someone to church. All the people you've been inviting to church that have told you no, they're not going to tell you no on Easter because everyone goes to church on Easter. So I've been getting ready for Easter. I'm praying over Easter. It's coming. And so I've been reading the story of Easter, and I've been noticing the, this, this pattern that happened. Jesus has the last supper with his disciples before he goes in to the battle that began in the garden where he gets arrested. Um, Then he goes and gets tortured, and then he goes to the cross. He dies on the cross. He goes to the tomb. And I was just looking at it. I'm like, what what happened in the midst of that, in the midst of the battle? Well, in the garden, he has an encounter with the enemy, the the evening wolves. 
And as the enemy came in to discourage, you know what he did? He reminded the enemy of his future. And some of you, because here's what happens in our life. Here's what happens. We start making steps toward God, and, and, and the enemy comes in and says, you're a fake. You're pathetic. You're a failure. Remember what you did earlier today? Stop praying. He starts reminding you of your past. And when, you, when he reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Like, what's his future? Well, in Revelation, it says he's kind of like a dragon, and God is going to put some chains of all the things that he's put on you. All those chains are going to get put on him, and he's going to be thrown into a lake of fire. He knows his end, and that's why he's so aggressively coming against you. It's because he doesn't want the goodness of God on your life the way that he used to experience it. So when the enemy reminds you of your past, you remind him of your future. But before the battle began, I wanted to know, like, what, what did Jesus turn to for his source of strength? I know he's Jesus, but, but what did Jesus do? And I found this verse that's so easily mis, misunderstood or even overlooked. He says, when, when the song, excuse me, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, sung a hymn. Now, a hymn is not that, that old traditional song that you grew up singing in church, if you grew up in church. Um, for those of you that didn't grow up in church, uh, it might even be your blessing. I don't know if it helped me or not. Um, but, but a hymn is just a spiritual song. Before Jesus went into the greatest battle of his life, he sang a song. What was he saying? There's going to be a victory, for the battle belongs to the Lord. He knew he had to raise his voice because worship is a weapon against worry. It's a weapon. It's hard to live in worship and worry at the same time. In fact, I'll go far as, so far as to say this. Worship doesn't just win the war. Worship is the war. Here, here's what that means. Here's what worship is. Whatever you give your life to, that's what you worship. Whatever is the, the greatest felt need of your heart, that's what you'll worship. That's what you'll seek after. Whatever the, the greatest passion of your life is, that's what you worship. The greatest fight in your life is what will you worship. And singing is, is worship. Giving is worship. God doesn't need your money, but he knows that money very easily can have you. He knew how easy it would be for people to worship money, worship stuff. I earned it. It's mine gifts that I gave you and the people that I gave them. And, and what if you started being faithful and, and giving as a form of your worship, believing that God can do more with what's left than what you could do on your own? Obeying is, is worship. Doing that thing that God told you to do that doesn't make any sense. That's worship. Worship doesn't just win the war. Worship is the war. The last one is this, keep showing up. Keep showing up. One of my favorite stories of businesses, I love history, I love business, uh, is the story of the Leatherman. Tim Leatherman owned a Fiat 600 that he had to fix all the time. And the tools that he needed most of the time to fix his car was a pocket knife and a pair of pliers. And on vacation, he had this idea, I wonder if you could take a pair of pliers and a knife and put them together. And he's like, that's probably pretty easy. I should go do that. And he goes home and he quits his job. And over the course of the next two years, he realizes this was a lot harder than what he thought it was. And on his birthday, two years in, he, he broke. He literally falls on his face in the, in the middle of his shop, just weeping. Overcome by the reality of know that I have this anymore. But the day that mattered was the next day. The next day, Tim Leatherman goes back into the shop and he goes back to work. And within the next year, not only did he develop, which what he called it, he originally was called Mr. Crunch. Um, he got a patent on Mr. Crunch. And then he spent the next three years or two years trying to sell Mr. Crunch at which everywhere he went to try to sell it, they told him there's no market for this. No one will ever want to buy this. Why did you even make this? This isn't worth anything. You probably shouldn't do this anymore. Year seven, year, year, not week, year seven, a friend of his says, hey, man, you're a great inventor, but maybe you just are sucky at business. How about I come in and help you? So his, his friend comes in and starts helping him on the sales end of it, and he approaches a little-known company, little outdoor company called Cabela's. And he shows the, 
what's now called Leatherman, uh, to Cabela's, and like, I think these could sell. We'll take 500 of them. And the first weekend they sold out, and they wrote a check for $12,000, and the rest is, is history. Well, today they have uh, 30 different models of the Leatherman with the pocket knife and, and the flyers. Winston Churchill says it's this success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. You see, a fight is not, hey, I tried once or twice and it didn't work out, so I'm out. I quit. Success, <laughs> success is this, is getting punched in the mouth, getting knocked on your back and you get up again, only to find yourself getting punched in the mouth again, finding yourself on your back again and getting up again, which is why the scripture says seven times a righteous man may fall, but he gets up again. And some of you today, you've been punched in the face. Some of you, you came in here on your back. And the worries of life, the anxiety of life, the downward spiral, the evening wolves have creeped in. And now's not the time to throw in the towel and give in to worry and fear. Now today's the day to win the day. Today's the day to get back up and fight. There are evening wolves that are looking to wipe you out wipe your relationships out. But today I believe that God wants to put a fight on the inside of you where there's gonna be some men inside of this church and some women inside this church who say, not in my house, not in my marriage, not with my kids, not in my finances. I believe that God's gonna win the day. I believe the promises of God are true for me. I believe that God's not done with me. I believe the best years of my life are ahead of me and not behind of me. The best years of my marriage are ahead of me and not behind. The best years of my kid's life, it's not over. It may look a little bit grim right now, but it's not over. Why? Because there's a fight inside of you. You've learned to fight like a champion. You don't fight with the weapons this world does. You've got something different inside of you. left we left the story of Larry and Chrissy in the water but what they didn't know was you're not the only one trying to win the war within as Larry kisses his wife what he believes for the last time he remembers that he's got a leatherman in his pocket and he pulls out the leatherman and he gets the knife out and he stabs the ice which gives him just enough leverage to pull himself out of the water, which he slowly turns and grabs his wife and pulls her out of the water. There's actually hundreds of stories of people's lives being saved because of the Leatherman. But on year two on his birthday, Tim Leatherman decided not to give in to being knocked on his back. He believed that there was a different future for his family, for his life. But what he didn't know was Larry and Chrissy would one day need what he had. I'm telling you, some of you today have some victories in your past that you leave locked up inside of you that you need to teach some other people how to fight. Some of you today are in the fight of your life and you need to get the right people that have experienced the victory that you need in your life. That's why we do connect groups. It's a midweek group where you can get some other people in your life to engage in the battle with you. You were never intended to fight alone. That's why we do what we call our dream team. It's all the people that serve here. They don't work for the church. They have found, you know what brings them the greatest joy? It's to make their life something bigger than them. What gives them joy is in the midst of the financial struggle, being faithful to give God and return to God what God already told them to give back. When they find freedom, hope, some friends that engage in the battle with them. And friends, there has been too much that God has planned for your life for you to give in and stop the fight. And the plans that God has for you are greater than anything that you can imagine. Living that best life, that's not a cute hashtag, that's the reality that God wants you to live in. Some of you today, you're in the fight of your life. And you need to make war. And you need 
need to start thinking like a champion, speaking like a champion, acting like a champion, and fighting like a champion, because that's who God says you are. So with head bowed and eyes closed, today if you find yourself in a place where you need some victory in your life, you're in the fight of your life and you need a power that's bigger than you, you need a strength that's bigger than you, you need a force on your side that's bigger than the force against you. And today, if you want to invite God into your battle, into your struggle, into your fight, right now, I just want you to raise your hand because I want to pray a, play, a prayer of blessing over you. Just raise your hand. I see hands going up all over the place right now. It's okay. You can participate in church. You can admit that you don't have it all together. But man, if you need God to come up and help you learn how to fight, I just want you to raise your hand up right now and say, I need to learn how to fight. Father, right now, you see these hands. You see even the hands that aren't raised. And God, right now, I pray that by your power that you would give them victory. And I pray that today wouldn't be the day that they throw in the towel, but today would be the day where they choose to fight. So God, would you move in a mighty way and bring victory to hopeless places in Jesus' name. Hey, my name is Pastor Brandon, and I want to thank you for watching this last video. I hope you feel encouraged, inspired, and you grow in relationship with Jesus. And if you're in our area, we'd love to see you on Sunday. And if you're not in our area, I would encourage you to find a church near you, because to live that better story is to live it with Jesus together.